First of all, thanks for coming, and thank you for coming to my friend Bob. I think Bob and I have known each other for 15, before I moved out here. Uh, so we've been having great conversations, and uh, we've learned to have conversations, sustain conversations. So I hope it's a good role model for you uh, of how we can be firm, civil, self-controlled, and yet I don't, I don't think Bob and I have a problem with firmly handling the issues with each other. Uh, just some housekeeping, or house rules. Um, we have a disproportionate number of evangelicals here. So let's, let's refrain from uh, clapping or rancor uh, till the very, very end, uh, just out of respect for Bob. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do 10 minutes, 10 minutes, take maybe like a two-minute break. Then we're going to do 40-minute dialogue, two-minute break, and then a 30-minute Q&A. Sound good? All right. Spencer Kimball wrote in The Miracle of Forgiveness. In my childhood, Sunday school lessons were given to us on the eighth chapter of John wherein we learned of the woman thrown at the feet of the Redeemer for judgment. This is the woman caught in adultery. My sweet Sunday school teacher lauded the Lord for having forgiven the woman. She did not understand the impossibility of such an act. In my years since then, I have repeatedly heard people praise the Lord for his mercy in having forgiven the adulteress. This example has been used numerous times to show how easily one can be forgiven for gross sin. But did the Lord forgive the woman? Could he forgive her? There seems to be no evidence of forgiveness. His command to her was, go and sin no more. He was directing the sinful woman to go her way, abandon her evil life, commit, sin no, more, commit no more sin, transform her life. He goes on second here. Another mistaken idea is that the thief on the cross was forgiven of his sins when the dying Christ answered, today you shall be with me, today you shall be with me in paradise. These men on the cross were thieves. How could the Lord forgive a malefactor? They had broken laws. There was no doubt of the guilt of the two men for the one voluntarily confessed their guilt. The Lord cannot save men in their sins, but only from their sins, and that only when they have shown true repentance. The one thief did show some compassion, whether selfishly, with hope we are not sure. He was confessing, but how could he abandon his evil practices when dungeon walls made evil deeds impossible? How could he restore the stolen goods when hanging on the cross? How could, as John the Baptist required, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance? How could he live the Lord's commands, attend his meetings, pay his tithing, serve his fellow men? All these take time. Time was the one thing he was running out of very rapidly. No unclean thing can enter the kingdom of heaven. He goes on, the thief's show of repentance on the cross was all to his advantage, but his few words did not nullify a life of sin. The world should know that since the Lord himself cannot save men in their sins, no man on earth can administer any sacrament which will do that impossible thing. The third we'll consider, King David. King David slept with Bathsheba and orchestrated the murder of her husband, Uriah. Kimball writes, For his dreadful crime, all his life afterward, he sought forgiveness. Some of the Psalms, Psalm 51, Psalm 32, portray the anguish of his soul, yet David is still paying for his sins. The prophet Joseph Smith underlined the seriousness of the sin of murder for David as for all men and the fact that there is no forgiveness for it. A murderer, for, for instance, one that sheds innocent blood cannot have forgiveness. 
Spencer Kimball reasons later in the book. A life is gone, and the restitution of it in full is impossible. Repentance in the ordinary sense seems futile. He also writes, Occasionally people who have murdered come to the church requesting baptism, having some partial realization of the enormity of their crime. Missionaries do not knowingly baptize such people. And then the fourth category. Kimball then quotes Joseph Smith on Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. If you remember in Acts 3, Peter says, You killed the author of life. Repent and your sins, that your sins may be blotted out. So Kimball, quoting Joseph Smith, He did not say to them, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. But he said, Repent therefore, And be converted that your sins may be blotted out. This is the case with murderers. They could not be baptized for the remission of sins. For they had shed innocent blood. Why did Kimball believe that these four were not forgiven? The woman caught in adultery. Jesus said to her. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Not forgiven. The thief on the cross. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Not forgiven. King David, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out all my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly of all my iniquity. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. Not forgiven. Those who killed Jesus, remember? You killed the author of life. Repent that your sins may be blotted out. Kimball says, not forgiven. Why did Kimball believe that these four categories, these four groups of people were not forgiven? There's two main reasons I want you to consider. First, Kimball believed that one's repentance must merit forgiveness. Likening repentance, Kimball writes, one cannot receive salary without having met satisfactorily the conditions of his employment. And also, one cannot expect a degree, of, one cannot expect a degree from any college without having paid his tuition and fees. He writes, if we, will, if, if we measure up fully We are guaranteed limitless blessings. He writes that a murderer may not be forgiven, but they, quote, may build up a credit balance in their favor. He writes that church activity, quote, helps us pile up credits against the accumulated errors and transgressions. He writes, we must not fail to do the right things to earn our exaltation. And he writes, the Lord will not give us a, quote, unearned blessing. And he says we must, quote, measure up to the celestial. And he writes, we must have the repentance, quote, which merits forgiveness. And he writes, there's a peace that comes with forgiveness that, quote, must be earned. Second reason. Kimball believed that God only forgives a sin or a sinful habit when the repentance for it reaches totality and completion. He writes, incomplete repentance never brought complete forgiveness. And of the woman caught in adultery, by the way, late addition to John 8, not part of the original text, but useful illustration. Kimball thought it was a useful illustration, so so we shall as well. Of the woman caught in adultery, Kimball explains, note that the Lord did not forgive the woman of her sin, of her serious sin. The woman had neither the time nor the opportunity to repent fully. When her preparation and repentance were complete, she could hope for forgiveness, but not before then. My thesis today is that, from my position, is that the only repentance that brings forgiveness is incomplete, partial spotty, not total, weak 
immature repentance that is sincere and genuine. And like a man says, I believe, help my unbelief. A child of God says, I repent, help my pathetic repentance. And I'll tell you a Jesus story in closing. There was a man named Zacchaeus, short dude. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. And people complained, you're eating with sinners, Jesus. And apparently Jesus showed him kindness. And Jesus said, or Zacchaeus said, everyone I've exploited, I repay them back fourfold. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, today salvation has come to this man's house. This is a son of Abraham. I get one more story. I have 15 seconds left. There were two men who walked up to the temple. One said, thank you, God, that I'm not like that other man over there. I'm religious. I'm righteous. And the second man approaching God said, he wouldn't even look up, and he said, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be called a son of God. I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. And Jesus said, that second man went home justified. Tap to start. Oh, <laughs> it seemed like you had a little more to say. I was, oh, I was like, okay. awkward ending here. <laughs> now just push start. Here. Okay. So hang on. Let's get slightly organized here. And it's only slight. All right, guys. Um, first, I want to thank Aaron for uh, setting this up. Uh, we've been talking about this for a couple of years, actually, trying to do something like this. So this is, this is good. Uh, timing has worked well. My wife's out of town. And, uh, and that was important because uh, uh, I actually don't speak for anybody. I'm, uh, so my name's Bob Vukic. Um, I'm generally considered an apologist for the LDS Church. Uh, I'm not paid by the LDS Church, neither uh, do, does anything that I say uh, count as official church doctrine. So I'm, and because my wife doesn't think this is even smart, I actually don't even speak for my family. I, sp I speak only for myself. So, uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, don't, don't write it down and send it in and say, here's what Bob said. Um, sure. Um, I'll pretend I'm on American Idol. So the... Uh, um, the Miracle of Forgiveness was a book that was written um, as a result of President Kimball's, or at the time he was Elder Kimball, he was a, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, uh, because he kept having consistent uh, conversations with people where he would give them the same references, the same uh, stories, and so over time in, uh, he would spend his evenings accumulating these into a book, and he finally uh, compiled it enough that he gave it to some of the other uh, general authorities. They reviewed it, they looked at it, and then he took it to a publisher, and the publisher said, it's way too long, cut it up, and so they cut the, the number of stories down. He says at the beginning of the book that it's you know, strictly his opinion, and that uh, he's responsible for it, and he also points out that he personally is uh, a sinner, but it would be sort of pointless to wait to preach the gospel until everyone was perfect that was going to actually do the preaching. So he, he stepped forward and, and did that. Um, I, I want to address, and this is actually kind of funny, but um, President Kimball's book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, is quoted, as near as I can tell, 17 times in general, author in, in general conference where it's referenced. And, um, and so a lot of times people will say, well, see, that makes it virtually you know, scripture-like. It's obviously being approvingly referred to. Under that criteria, C.S. Lewis ought to be a general authority. He's quoted 27 times in general conference over the years. And so the fact that we quote something approvingly doesn't mean that we endorse everything that's in that. Okay? Um, since this is a mixed group, you know, there's like uh, three Mormons and, and 85 non-Mormons in here. So mixed group. Um, because it's mixed group, I'm really going to uh, start at the beginning. And... I'm going to use the Bible as the basis for the conversation. I'm not going to uh, refer to LDS scriptures except as needed because it, it reflects an LDS opinion. And so what, I'm, what I want to talk about is what is forgiveness of sins and what is repentance? What, is, what constitutes repentance according to the, according to the Bible? And so um, 
when the, when the scriptures were given, they were given to a specific audience that thoroughly understood what the words meant. And over the, last, the next 2,000 years up to our day, those words have in many times, many ways changed meanings. Uh, in fact, some of the even basic rules of grammar got lost along the way. There's a thing, those of you that read Greek, there's a thing called the Granville Sharp Rule, which uh, a man named Granville Sharp uh, discovered in the uh, 19th century. Seems a little late, right? Since there was 19 centuries of people reading the scriptures that apparently didn't understand uh, this, this grammatical construction. And so it's important for people to realize that the Bible was given in a context, and that context uh, was understood by the people that received it. And so I'm going to talk really quick. I've got six minutes, and so I'm going to talk about six topics. Uh, grace, faith, justification, repentance, obedience, and the perfection of the saints. So the concept of grace as understood by the uh, um, early Christians and non-Christians and Jews came from an understanding of of the Greek word is charis, of this, of this uh, system of reciprocity that existed for at least 700 years before the time of Jesus. And what that meant was, is that a person of higher status, a patron or a benefactor, would give a gift that a lower person, a, a receiver, could not afford and could not work for himself. Therefore, and think about Paul in Ephesians, right? So it's by grace you are saved through faith and not of works. Um, but we are made unto good works, right? So we're supposed to do good works. And so the point is, is that when a benefactor would give a gift, the expectation of the receiver was that that receiver would become loyal. And they actually used an interesting word. They said they would become pistis. Pistis is the Greek word for faith or belief. And so it was completely understood that when grace was given, faith was the, the reciprocation. And this was, in, this was in the general world. This was not a religious understanding. And so they understood when Paul starts teaching about grace and, and faith and works, they understand that if the grace is given and you receive it, you owe fealty, you owe re- loyalty to the person, in this case, the ultimate giver of good gifts, God. And if you don't do that, it was understood that the grace could be cut off. Now, you wouldn't lose the grace that they gave you. So, for example, um, the, the book of Romans teaches about justification, that all men have been justified. If you read Romans 5 and you, and you go through there, it talks about the fact that, um, and so if you read Romans 5, 18 and 20, 520 actually says, uh, for all men have been justified unto life, have received justification unto life. But the very next, the first verse of chapter 6 says, What shall we do? Continue in sin that grace may abound. Let it never be so. In other words, it was clearly understood that these people receiving grace, if they continued to do what they were doing before they received the grace, that, th- that future graces would be taken away from them. Therefore, their justification was, as Mormons believe, was resurrection. That... That was a very big deal to the early Christians, the fact that their bodies would be restored to that relationship that existed in the Garden of Eden, and they would have that relationship with God again. That was a very big deal to the early Christians, but they completely understood that they had to be loyal and faithful and obedient. And as it says in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, Jesus Christ learned perfection by the things which he suffered, and he became the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. Okay, And so when you read in, in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 16, Paul rhetorically asks the question, but not all have obeyed. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So the two things were interchangeable. Belief and obedience were understood to be the same thing. Finally, we come to repentance. Repentance was the Greek word metanoeo. And what it meant is that a person's mind would be changed. And it would get to the point where that person absolutely repulsed, was repulsed and hated the sin. And that they had the ability or the desire to completely change their life and cast it out. And failure to continue on that path was seen as weakness. Um, and, and, uh, and I won't read it now, but Thayer's uh, dictionary, uh, which is a, a well-known, it's not, the, I actually have the best dictionary with me too, but it's a lot heavier, so I didn't bring it up. But Thayer's mentions that people are actually, get to the point with repentance where they are repulsed, where they never do it again. And failure to refrain from doing it again was the sign that they actually had not repented, okay? 
And, and so that we already talked about obedience. And finally, I want to talk about perfection of Christians. So Christian, as most of us know, was a derogatory term that was applied to the Christians first at Antioch, right, according to the Bible. And that uh, the real term that they called each other was saints. That was the most common name used in the, uh, in the New Testament of, of the members of the church. Well, saints is a Greek word, hagias, and what that word means is holiness. It's the same word that's applied in Revelation where it says, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And if you read back in, in uh, Psalms chapter or 89, Psalm 89, uh, verse 7, it talks about the fact that in the council of the holy ones, King James Bible translates it poorly as saints because it makes it sound like these are people. No, in the council of the holy ones, in other words, the destiny of humankind as stated in, in um, Genesis chapter 1 uh, where it says that man was created that he would have dominion over all the creations of God. And that's reiterated in Psalm chapter 8 uh, verse 6 where it says the, the creation, all of the God's works are created to be given to man, to have uh, um, sovereignty by man over all of those creations. And so the, the, the point of our life is to become like God. And that's a whole different subject, but that's the point of why God has this uh, difficult path at times for repentance, because true repentance does require refraining from the sin. Now, Doctrine and Covenants 46, verse 20 something or other, says that uh, all of these gifts are given uh, unto us uh, who keep all the commandments, and then it has a caveat right next to it, and it says, and those that seek to do so. Uh, as John, 1 John says, um, any man who says he is without sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. People understand, in the church, people understand that they have to, they have to work at repentance constantly because that is the one thing that we can always do. And so when President Kimball talked about the fact that repentance was at times took time, was long, that kind of thing, it, it, it was. But using the example of the woman uh, caught in adultery, when he says, go and sin no more, anyone in here think that he was actually saying to her, I, I have faith in you. You will never commit so much as kick the dog kind of sin. You will not have any further sin in your life. Or the man that was possessed of devils, who when they were exorcised from him, um, Jesus said to him, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Does anybody think that that man wasn't going to sin again? Of course he was. But the, the Bible teaches that if your heart is perfect, you're perfect with God. And interestingly, it even says that about David, who is said to have had a perfect heart all the days of his life, even during the uh, incident with Uriah, sending him to the front. So I want to thank everybody for, oh, I guess I have one minute. So let's, uh, let's uh, eat tacos or something. I don't know here. Let's, um, so the, uh, um, well, Gosh, I ran, ran so fast, I don't really have a lot to say. The, uh, I, I just want to make it really clear. If you don't understand who God is, and then none of the other pieces are going to fall together. You're not going to have an understanding of why he wants repentance. You're not going to have an understanding of what comes after repentance. You're not going to have an understanding of, of what's important. The, the Bible teaches explicitly, the very first thing that people did, and it, this is always given short shrift, is, is when they, Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree, um, the devil, uh, the serpent, had said to them, uh, you, won't, you will not die, you will become like God, to know good and evil. Of course, the lie of that was that they wouldn't die. That was true. But God himself, in, in Genesis 3.22, says, Behold, the man has become as one of us. And who's he talking to? He's talking to the council of divine beings, is, is who it is. And he says he's become as one of us to know good and evil. And that's a merism. In other words, it's a, it's a description of, of all things in between. Good and evil is sort of a description that they've had, they've had knowledge imparted to them. And so for us, oh, I'm over time. That's what the issue is. I'm sorry. Well, if I could read the clock, you know, I'd be good. So I apologize. But um, we can talk about some of these other issues um, on, our, uh, on our back and forth. Okay. Can you guys hear Bob? So work for everybody. We're good. Okay. A little more obnoxiously loud, like me. I'll give it my best. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, hmm. Let's start here. 
There is a book written by Spencer Kimball's son. Yep. And there's some really neat footnotes in there. Well, so while you're finding that, let me just make a, a comment about that, too. So uh, Spencer W. Kimball's grandson, Chris, mm-hmm. actually came out and said that he felt that the... In the Tribune? Uh, in the Tribune. Yeah, you probably saw the article. He came out and said that he thought it should be disavowed, that the, the entire miracle of forgiveness should be disavowed uh, by the church because he felt, specifically, he was talking about there's a section that discusses rape, and he felt like it was so uh, misconstrued that he felt... I think that's an church. overstatement. In the Tribune article, it's Jordan Kimball, his grandson. Okay. He says, I would want him to be remembered for his love, compassion, and encouragement. It grew out of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It didn't, didn't seem out of place then, but it was used beyond its date. Even the church has moved on. He goes on to say he's a psychologist, yeah. and he didn't like the stuff on sexuality. But there's, not a, there's no complete disavowal. No, he actually, word. in there, he uses the word. He believes that the church should disavow it. I, I, I'm Pulling? pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure in the article that I saw, he actually uses that word, disavow. Okay, so yeah. a question for you. Yeah. Is the miracle of forgiveness uh, grapes, thistles, or is it figs, or is it thorn bushes? So most of the time today, and, and I've, I've served in various uh, church leadership positions, most of the time when people are given the assignment of reading the miracle of forgiveness, it's a directed reading kind of thing. It's read these chapters, read from here, uh, you know, these kind of concepts illustrate what we're trying to work on. And, um, and c- candidly, I kind of look at it like uh, the New Testament, again, going to Romans chapter 10, where it says, and how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach except they be sent? Faith comes by uh, hearing the word preached. And so I believe, honestly, that the interaction between human beings on something as grave as, as serious repentance issues, because he's not talking about just like, you know, I got mad at my laundry and, you know, yelled at it or swore. He's talking about all sins. He's talk, but he's, he lists like a hundred sins, he, right? He does, but he's really primarily talking about um, grievous sins. And but he goes out of his way to say, I want you to know I'm not just talking about sexual sins. Correct. I'm talking about all sins. Correct. And then we all eventually have to overcome that. During, during Kimball's uh, presidency, actually, during his lifetime and during his presidency, the, the book Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith was, was uh, republished. It had been published in the 1950s. It was republished in the 75, it's 75 I think. And in there, during the uh, uh, King Follett discourse, Joseph Smith specifically says that, uh, and, and I say this because President Kimball would have been aware of this, okay, since it was published during his lifetime and he's obviously read it, that... Um, our, our salvation is ultimately like climbing a ladder, and we will not reach the top of that ladder until a long time after we pass through the veil. Can I back up a little bit? Sure. I don't see disavow. You might be right. I just can't okay. see it. But what he does say is I wish, I hope the book, he wants the book to be sunsetted. That's the strongest yeah. language I can, I can find. Okay. Um, the other thing is his son writes in a footnote, foreign publication rights were given to the church. So I'm thinking about the preface. It's okay. like, hey, I absolve the church of any responsibility. For this book, foreign publication rights were given to the church, and by 1940, 1974, arrangements have been made for translation into 16 languages. In 1998, the, to- the total in all languages was roughly estimated at 1.6 million copies. Yep. And he says a, a note appears from 1974 indicates that he had himself, Kimball, had given away 1,300 copies. Yes. He believed in the book. Well, he, he wishes he had lowered his tone. But my, my, I do not share the same kinds of uh, concerns as my secular friends. Or I, my, my concern isn't the tone. Uh, my concern is the structure of argument he gives for the repentance, which is a precondition for forgiveness. So I, I would want to ask you, what do you think, in your reading of the book, what do you think Kimball lays out as a precondition for forgiveness? What kind of totality, I'm kind of giving it away, what kind yeah. of completion of repentance lead, uh, finally brings forgiveness? Sure, I, well, the, the concept in the church is always taught, broken heart and contrite spirit, right, is, is that what people have to bring, and, and in the New Testament, you know, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance, right? So we're not talking about that, and, and this is really his point, and I think culturally, in the, in the area that this book was written, you know, the, the kind of the pendulums over here that you've got to, you've got to be completely clean. And, and he's, and uh, candidly, you know, President Kimball was no Bible scholar um, in the sense that he didn't read the languages. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't like immersed in, in the Bible as a, as a tool. Okay. But according to Kimball in his book, yeah. what did it take to get forgiven? 
Well, you, you had to repent. You had to actually repent. What were the steps or the elements of repentance that he lays out? There, well, there's, what, five steps to repentance or whatever, and recognition. Um, can we list them out together? Well, I don't know if I can name them all. Uh, it's can been, do it with you? It's been a while since I've for, been a missionary. For structure of our conversation? Yeah. Six. Okay. Uh, sometimes he lists five and yeah. omits one obvious one. Faith. Faith. Sorrow. Restitution. Uh, missed one. Recognition. F- confession. I'm just putting yeah. out of order there. So faith, sorrow, confession restitution, so confession to the appropriate parties, right. restitution in as far as it is possible, right. complete, total, successful, point of no return, urges, cleared out of your mind, total abandonment of sin, right. and keeping the commandments. Well, and the first faith, I guess, would be recognition. Because I know that the very first one is, you have to, re- you know, this is like a 12-step program. You first have to recognize that you've got a problem before you can even begin to... Is that a fair summary, it. you think? Yeah, I think that's right. So uh, applying that to the thief on the cross, yes. why, why does Kimball and your thought, why does Kimball not think the thief on the cross can be forgiven on the cross? Well, he, he, right after, in that section, he says it's because he didn't have time to actually repent. I mean, the, the, the idea... Fully, uh, totally. Right. From, you know, it's a Catholic doctrine that you can receive a grace, which is, of course, last rites, and be forgiven on your deathbed. That that, that kind of re- repentance is available. And um, the church just rejects that, that if if the reason, and this is, this is very consistent with Second, uh, Chronicles, or Second Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 9, where, where he, he says, look, I'm glad I made you sad, because you, you, if I just made you sad to the world, it wouldn't have been any good. But because I made you sad after a godly manner, um, you've been, you are going to be able to be saved, you, know, you, you can repent unto salvation. And, and so the, the fact is, is while well, you're hanging on a cross and, and you're looking at the abyss, you know, was he saved, was he not saved? I mean, honestly, that's not either President Kimball or my, my call to make, right? But, he did make the call. Well, I know he did. Well, he, but, uh, he, he made a judgment. He right? made a judgment that, that it, there wasn't sufficient time. And, of course, again, in Latter-day Saint doctrine, we believe that there's a spirit world. Uh, where they did go, and there was a, a paradise and a prison. But he couldn't do anything there that he had the opportunity to do here, according to Kimball. Um, there's no, there's yeah, no spirit so, world repentance for things that ought to have been done here, but were failed. Sure, but were, were, again, were, this, he has failure to do. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. So it, he's really yeah. strict. No progression between kingdoms. Yeah. No, I mean, he, he, if you're a Latter-day Saint, you've spent 70 years, you've had enough time to... There's nothing in the afterlife you're going to be able to do that you were able to do here. So, again, I think the... The tone of the book. I'm not. Uh, the to- no, no. I'm, the I'm, claim, I'm, the affirm, the, uh, the no, proposition. No, right? no. So. I, I get it, and and that's what I'm saying is that the, the tone of the book and and of of his remarks is uh, honestly, it's like it's like going. I I recently had a chance to go to a, a Pentecostal church uh, just for fun, and it was it was fun. I enjoyed it, and uh, but you know you get the hellfire and brimstone and the yelling and and all that. I mean, it was very interesting. It was very fun, and. Um, and, Weeping and gnashing of teeth. I, you get the whole. They didn't have snakes, so that was good. My wife was glad, but the, uh, but you know they had all of the. Well, I mean, they the preached things. weeping. weeping oh, and yeah, gnashing yeah. Of teeth. The, the, that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, yes, and that your the worm will never die. Right. The, I mean, the tormented they're, they're day and scaring, night forever. And they're ever. trying to scare you into making a decision for Christ, right? You know, and, fear has some place. In uh, that, right? uh, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of reverence or yeah. something like Go that. Go ahead. Right? Sorry, I interrupted. So the uh, um, so in the case of what Kimball's doing, I believe, is, is he's really trying to make the case to not procrastinate your, your repentance. I mean, you know, Book of Mormon, that gets quoted all the time, you know, this is the life, this is the time to repent. And it is if you have an awareness of it. And, and Which he's clear, Latter-day Saints, normal functioning adult Latter-day Saints have, an aware, have sufficient awareness. They should, is what he's saying. They should have. But, I, but that's one of the things... Well, he, he's not as oozy as goosey, goosey, no, goosey as people are today. He's like, hey, if you haven't heard of the LDS gospel... You got another chance, but right. if, if, if you have heard of it and you've spent time in tes- fast and testimony meetings, you've gone to seminary, you've gone through all these priesthood meetings, right. he's like, you, you should know. You should know. You should know. And, and so a Latter-day Saint, according to Kimball, who's failed to live celestial law, yeah. who's failed to, in his words, measure up to celestial law, cannot do in the afterlife what he, was, he should have done here. Again, it's the should, and you know that, that that is the language, and that's why I say is paying your full is, tithing, is, attending yeah. all your meetings, right? Getting he, temple married. He, he he itemizes all those things. And if you and fail to do that here, yes, how are you going to do that later? You can't do it later. And and so you're you're, it, you're damned again, to a lesser kingdom. But it goes it goes to that point again of of what does the person understand? 
and you know, and interestingly, so in the section that he where he discusses uh, uh, loss of chastity, and he specifically addresses rape, it's a, there's a paragraph on it, and where he does that, he he actually says, you know, where where there's no um, let me let me let me look it up here because he says uh, where there's no uh, will or desire or participation. I can't remember the exact word he uses. There is no. By the way, it seems guilt. like I, I think you'd agree with me, and I don't think I don't want to stick on this point too yeah. long. But not very pastoral in his language about rape victims. Well, I, I've got it right here. Let me read it, okay? Just because I think this is good. Is uh, it's a section under uh, restitution for the loss of chastity. And by the way, one of the one of the concept. I, one of the concepts that I find really actually, I don't know, funny is the wrong word, um, just interesting, is uh, he actually says that people should, if you know, a man and a woman uh, uh, lose their chastity to one another, that they ought to get married. He, I mean, that they, they should marry each other. That that's if, one they, of the only ways. If they're messing ways. around, right, and, they're, and they want to be responsible, he gives them this pretty good counsel about, hey, you guys need to structure the way you do dates, the way you do dances. Right. You need to make sure you live a... Uh, I, I was cheering him on largely in the chapters where he says you need to, to plan out your youth, so to speak, right. to safeguard yourself from sexual sin. Right. That was good stuff. And I, the secular people who, who cringe at that, I, I'm okay yeah. saying, hey, let, hey he was, he was, you don't even need to be a prophet to give that kind of wisdom. That's, you, should be, you should be careful. Right. Um, but uh, but with, with, with victims, though, right. he's like, hey, you, if, you, if you were really righteous, you would fight them off to the death. And well, if you didn't do that, he... he... So, so that's where I actually, I, I actually don't think it says that. And okay. that's why I wanted to read it. So let me, let me it's, it's uh, under the restitution for loss of chastity. It says, also far reaching is the effect of loss of chastity. Once given or taken or stolen, it can never be regained. Even in a forced contact, such as rape or incest, incest the injured one is greatly outraged. If she has not cooperated and contributed to the foul deed, she is, of course, in a more favorable position. There is no condemnation where there is no voluntary participation. It is better to die defending one's virtue than to live having lost it without a struggle. Now, the, the issue here is the way Kimball writes. All right? and, and so what I want to just point out is, is throughout yeah. the book, what he does is he, he, he structures all of his paragraphs in the same manner. If there's more than one sentence, then the first, paragraph, the first sentence of a paragraph is always the assertion, right? It's, the, it's what, the, what the topic is. Then he'll put supporting material in, and then he restates it at the end. And so, when he, so he starts that particular statement by saying, also far-reaching is the, loss, uh, the effect of the loss of chastity, and he concludes it's better to die in defending one's virtue than to live having lost it without a struggle. I don't believe he's tying that to the rape victim. I, I, to me, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I would have used different language. Yes. I, you probably would, I would too. I would, too, yeah. But here, here's a good point. We, I, I hope we can agree on principle. What Kimball had to say about the structure or the elements of repentance that leads to forgiveness, whether or not he was right about the basic gospel uh, of repentance that leads to forgiveness, is a thousand times more important than whether he used, e even more than whether he used appropriately pastoral language about right. sexual victims. Let me ask, can I ask you a question? Of course. Uh, speaking of uh, Bathsheba, the victim yes. of David. Um, Question, should David be upheld today as a role model illustration uh, of someone who was forgiven? Well, you know, he, he prophesied himself, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, right? So at some point he, he believed that he was going to receive forgiveness. Well, rescued from the grave forgiveness, but not well, and, celestial exaltation. And, and, and honestly, again, I, I, I'm... Uh, Spencer's very clear, yeah, I know. and he quotes, Spencer, quotes Joseph Smith on this. David will not be in the celestial kingdom, at least as an exalted being, uh, being in yeah. the fullness of eternal life. Uh, he, he, he has forever disqualified himself from the fullness of eternal life, and he will never be fully forgiven. Kimball's very clear yeah, about that. Well, and I'm trying to make sure that I answer this in the right manner, okay? So... The, the fact is, is that when you sin against the light, when you sin against, when you knowingly commit a sin that you're being told is wrong, you shouldn't do it, and, and you do it anyway, then repentance from that is very hard. And when it involves, uh, in, the, in the case of Bathsheba, murder. adultery and, yeah. and murder, um, you know, just historically, by the way, uh, 
once he committed the, the sin of adultery with Bathsheba, and by the way, she was clearly trying to entice him, all right? So this was, this was not like... like she I don't was, care. It's uh, all David's fault. It, well, it's not all David's fault because Bathsheba was a willing participant as if well. If David was in my church, I'd say, I don't care. You're the man and you, have to, you should cut off your hand to... To, to fight for right. sexual purity, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Uh, but so it's, there's but, zero relevance. That's that's totally well. No, irrelevant. it, it, it yeah. does matter. I mean, the, the, who's involved in this matters. But he was actually trying. I mean, I, I can point you to some some you know non LDS documentation that that shows that David was in fact trying to make it right. So was he that, ever fully forgiven? So in, in he according to Spencer he, Kimball, he up until the point where he had Uriah killed by putting him in the front line. He could have been forgiven. When he but, part, when he did, so in sorry. in First John chapter five, uh, John specifically makes the point: there is a sin unto death. I do not say that you should pray for that sin. In other words, people, th- there are sins that we can commit, and in, in, including murder, that are sins that we can't pray for forgiveness for. Okay, that aren't going to come. Let me ask you a question. Sure, I'm a little passionate here. Yeah, fine. Did you kill somebody? Um, yes. Yes. No. I hope not. I participated in the murder of Jesus Christ. Okay, well, in Acts 3, you killed the author of life. I may, I may just as well be in that crowd. All right? His sin, I'm sorry, my sin was put on Jesus at the cross. So it is totally appropriate for Christians to say, I participated in the murder of Jesus Christ. He died because I sinned. So here, here, here's, it's inappropriate. I would disagree with it, that characterization. Okay, so... You're reading of 1 John 5, yeah. is that it's inappropriate to pray for forgiveness for murder. So my extended question to you. Yeah. Psalm 51. Okay. Clearly, in response to the murder and adultery incident, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. I remember the first uh, evangelistic street conversation I ever had in Utah. I forgot everything. All, all this book stuff just went, poof, and all I had was Psalm 51 in front of me, and I asked an LDS person on the street, was David forgiven? Did he get what he asked for when he said, deliver me, redeem me from blood guiltness, right? And he wouldn't answer. So it, finishing the question here, forgive me. Thanks for your patience. All right. And I, when I was in high school, and I started rea- realizing how much of a slave I was to sin, I realized, man, this is not just a series of decisions. This is like my spiritual DNA. I, I'm a slave to sin. And I, I, I rationalized, well, I still need to be good enough to be forgiven. I need to get to a place where my repentance is full enough. And I just can't get there. I keep doing a lot of the same things over and over again. And I came across Romans 4. Okay. And I'll just quote a few verses and hand it back to you. Paul says, when a man works, his wages are not counted to him as his due. Uh, sorry. No, it, yes. Thank you. <laughs> when a man works, his wages are not counted to him as a gift, yeah. but as his due. Right. But to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, comma, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counted righteousness apart from works. And he goes on, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. Blessed is the man whose transgressions will never be counted against him. And he's quoting Psalm 32, which is by David. And I'm looking at this, this Paul guy. But back then I'm thinking, oh, I, I'm ungodly. I need to trust the God that justifies the ungodly. And then that's when I got justified, forgiven, saved. But now I think, wow, Paul's upholding David still in the first century as alongside Abraham, example of forgiveness. Uh, Thanks for your patience. Yeah, no, I don't think he's actually saying it's an example of forgiveness. I think, it's, I think what he's saying is, is actually quoting David, which was, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven him. David is, it's not an example of forgiveness, Sagan? Well, because David is not, David throughout the rest of his life is, is obviously tortured by the fact that, he, that what he did with Uriah. Um, and, and he can, you know, again, if the Psalms are any indication, I mean, he never feels forgiven, at least according to the Psalms. And so the, I, I, don't, I don't think he does. And the, Do you think David will ever feel forgiven in the future? Um, yes, at some point. I, I believe he will. Fully? To a celestial eternal life and exaltation? So, again, there are things that we can do in this life which stop our progress eternally. 
And um, will he regret forever disqualifying himself from the fullness of eternal life? If, if God's justice is applied to us in certain ways where we're fully exposed to his justice, then regardless of how bad you feel, uh, so people that are damned, are they, people that are damned, do they ever have a chance to not be damned? Do they ever have a chance to come out of hell after God says, oh, you know, here, here's the balance of your life. You, you didn't accept Christ or whatever the issue is. Side note here, from an LDS perspective, as yeah. I understand it, yeah. according to Kimball, there's no progression between kingdoms. He's very clear. And according to other LDS leaders, to be in the terrestrial or a telestial kingdom is itself in a, ter- in a kind of eternal punishment, its own kind of hell. John Witzow right. says it's, that the, it's the mental torture of being in a bottom kingdom will be worse than physical torture. So that the heaven, the heaven of the terrestrial and telestial kingdom will in, a, in reality be hellish, tormenting and a punishment. So in that light, David forever is suffering eternal torment in that sense. Sure. From the LDS perspective, in, at least as those authors go. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm not sure that I would care about what Witso says, to be honest, just because uh, Joseph Smith himself, uh, ta- since talking about the celestial kingdom, said... We'll make it more modest. We'll was, say Joseph F. Is it Fielding Smith. Joseph yeah. Fielding Smith. So many. Yeah, Joseph there's a lot Smith. of F's. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Joseph... Fielding Smith says that it's an eternal punishment. Right. Yeah, and, and the church came out with a, uh, a statement in the 19, well, early 1960s, actually. Uh, Harold B. Lee was the, uh, was the one who put it out that just said that uh, the church does not have a doctrine or a, a decision on whether or not there's movement between the kingdoms because uh, there were, in fact, other of the presidents of the church that seemed to indicate that there if was. If only you guys had a prophet. Yeah, if there is, well, if, if, every, if every line of doctrine was defined, it'd be easier, right? So, yeah, no, I know, you're, we're good. Well, I'm, Jeff, I'm not, I'm, if I'm only not. they saw us in private on the street. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, uh, what, but what I wanted to, to mention is, is that if you, you know, going back to what my opening remarks were, is the fact is, is that repentance is a complete hatred of the actions that you're engaged in. That, that the, if you go back to what the Bible teaches, metanoeo, and uh, the... So David uh, hated what he did, though, right? He hated, but did he repent? How, how did he... And he did. He got to that point. And how can he make restitution? I mean, that's what Kimball's point is, right? How do you make restitution for murder? Th- this blows me away because Colossians 2 or 3 says, the record of debt that stood against us was nailed, nailed to the cross. Right. And it talks about our forgiveness of sins in light of that. So I, I just can't imagine any Christian saying... Well, I, I guess he can't pay restitution. My, the rest of, in this light, yeah. none of my sins I can pay restitution for to satisfy God. Right. None of them. So murder or lust or irritability with my kids, all of that, none of that can be pay, paid restitution for. So why not just say, okay, on the cross. David's in heaven now, enjoying the fullness of eternal life, completely forgiven. It is finished. It's, it's, oh, I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm just baffled. Like, why, so, well, why make an exception here? Why not, why not just take David's guilt and his, la- his inability to pay restitution and just put it on the cross? So uh, at least one point of this is the fact that the guy who gets to make that decision is Christ. And he's made the criteria for what it takes to get forgiveness, to what it takes to be born again. He, he's the one who put out this, this criteria. Did he, say maximal restitu- did he say restitution for murder was, I mean, did he speak to this? Well, specifically? Did he need to? I don't know. So, so you know, the Paide Gogas, the, 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 the master that brings us to the, to the gospel was the Old Testament law. And in there, 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 he actually does speak to it there very clearly. You die. You know, that if you kill somebody, you should be killed. I'm going to die. And, well, again... I'm going to die because of... Your, your characterization right? that you murdered Christ is actually, I think, is, is an exaggeration, to be candid, because, because the, the fact is that the, the people that actually murdered Christ did so um, because they were ignorant of who he was. Because had they known who he was, they wouldn't have slain the Lord of glory, is what Paul says. And, and so, Which is interesting, because Spencer Kimball, quoting Joseph Smith, says, would that ye had acted in, ignorantly, but you know as well as I do, a good English translation in, of Acts 3 is Peter saying, I know that you acted with ignorance. They, they botched that one. Yes. Isn't that amazing, the mistranslations? I don't know how that happens. But. So, the, uh, so the point is, is that I'm just kidding, so anybody that thought I was doing anything else there. Yeah. But the, um, I'm not mad. I know, you're not. So the, the point is, is that 
in the situation of what sins are forgiven, what aren't, what's nailed to the cross, what's not. As I said, uh, justification is something that was applied universally to everybody. Everyone has been justified. But to retain that, uh, that gift of justification, which is why the doctrine in LDS... Does your church teach that everyone's justified? Yeah, that's why, ba- that's why Moroni specifically teaches that it, it's a heinous sin to say that babies are, are going to hell. But does your church teach that even without faith, according to Romans 5, your reading of it, yeah. all are justified? Yeah, all are justified because... So you, but your, your church authorities read Romans 5 the same way you do? It's a, this is an area where I'm like, uh, is this a Bob thing or is this No, a, this isn't... Well... It's a Bob thing in the sense that I'm pointing it out, but the fact is that uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 21, and 22 says that all people are resurrected, right? That it's 100%. You know, as in Adam, all die. As in Jesus Christ, all men will be made alive. Context really helps, though, right? And so how does that take place? And the only way that that could take place to all men is if there was a sacrifice for all men to make that possible. How does Romans teach you get justified? How does, well, Romans teaches that justification comes naturally to you. That, I, again, Romans 5, 18, well, you start in verse 12, but uh, as you read through Romans, uh, Romans chapter 5, and, and it explains Just, that, just to be clear, Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, yes. since we have been justified, justified. by faith, right. oh, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right, and, but remember what faith is, right? So, uh, and that's, again, that's why I started with an explanation of what early Christians would have understood that meant. That, that justification, that grace was a gift that was given by the ultimate uh, you know, benefactor. You're equating faith payment. with obedience? Are you equating faith uh, yes, with all absolutely. obedience? absolutely. Are you, are you equating pistis, pistis, with all of obedience? So, so there's a phrase that exists from that time and that we use through to today, which is keep the faith, right? So when you say keep the faith, are you saying you know, keep your trust? Or are you saying live consistently with the things that you've so been taught? So there's a semantic range, so right? There so is. A, a faithful it, it, person is obedient. But in, in the normal usage of Paul, like Romans 4, verses 4 and 5, to the one who does not work, right. but trusts him who justifies the ungodly. Side note, JST got it wrong. Joseph Smith can't do Greek. I, I agree with that. So you're not going to like drag me into something there. That's... You think Joseph Smith got Romans 4 or 5 wrong? Um, I think... Just be clear to the crowd. Yeah, yeah. The JST, the jo- Joseph, Joseph Smith Mitchell. translation has a, 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 a translation there, I guess, uh, that talks about that uh, he cannot justify. He puts a knot in there, uh, the ungodly. So, so the, the good English translations say God justifies the ungodly. ungodly. And the Joseph Smith said God justifies, God justifieth not, not the ungodly. Yeah. But, but Paul himself, in that passage at least, he's contrasting a kind of working and a kind of faith. And also in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, there's a, there seems to be a meaningful distinction between grace and faith and the works that we do. And there's some sort of works we have to stop doing, stop trusting. And, and then there's a kind of trust that's antithetical. Right. Uh, R- Romans, uh, at the end of a 9 and the beginning of, of 10, they sought it as though it were by works, not as though by faith. Right. So, right. And this goes back to what the hermeneutic is that you need to use on what grace and faith and works are. And because the understanding, the people absolutely understood this, this concept of reciprocity, that they, that they were going to receive something and that in order for them to continue to receive benefits, they owed loyalty back, they, fealty, that they had to continue to be loyal. And they actually, again, in that time period, they actually used the word pistis, faith, as, as what you owed back for, for the grace. And so it's not surprising in 5.1 where he says, you know, having been justified, you know, uh, by faith, absolutely. That's, 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 that's what happened. On this note, can I share a Jesus story? Sure. I love Jesus. Luke 7 or 8. Luke 7. Woman comes, wipes Jesus' feet with her hair, expensive perfume. Uh, I think one of the Pharisees says, that's, that's just crazy. You should have sold that, given it to the poor. And Jesus says, he turns to Peter and he says, Peter, I got a story for you. There were two men, one owed, was it 50 denarii, one owed 500 denarii. Right. The master to whom they were indebted forgave their debts. And Peter asks, I'm sorry, Jesus asks, which of the two do you think will love his master more? Thinking of the loyalty here. Right. Which of the two will have more loyalty, right. more love? And Peter says, well, I suppose the one who has had the greater debt. And Jesus goes on to say, you know, I came inside, you guys, you know, you, you didn't treat me like, she's, she's, he goes on to say, she, he who is forgiven little, 
loves, li- loves little. And it, it seems to me that if you really wanted maximum loyalty out of a, uh, a person in the gospel, in the, in the New Testament, the way that God gets loyalty out of people, it is, it's out of freely forgiving all their sins. And, then, and these people are, are now like, totally basking in, oh, I am justified. No, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I remember when I was in high school, when God forgave me, when he, when he cleansed me, when he totally justified me, the first thing I thought to do was forgive my mom. Because I, at the time I thought she was irrational, I hated her. And then I thought, I reasoned, well, if uh, God forgave me, then I should forgive her. And then I read later, Colossians and Ephesians, forgive others as you have been forgiven. So I look at Spencer's book and I say, you're robbing people of the deeper repentance that comes from the enjoyment of having been forgiven for all your sins because the way you grow in obeying the commandments and loving and repenting is by having all your sins forgiven so that you'll feel more free to all love as you've been loved and forgive as... You've, you've got to do some more monologues like me, so it's a little more balanced. So. It's okay. I'm okay with that. I've, great stories, right? So, but, um, so, but I'm, but I'm going to go back to the Bible. How's that? I'm going to go back to the... A Bible, a Bible. Yeah, we have a Bible. So, so this, is, this is, in fact, uh, this is from Thayer's. This is a, a, you know, I took a picture because I didn't want to have to haul it over. From Thayer? Thayer's, Thayer's, T-H-A-Y-E-R-S, Thayer's. Uh, uh, lexicon of the New Testament. It's, it's one of the more commonly used out there. It's, it's older, but it's still, it's still well used. And it says, um, it, talking specifically about repentance, it says, to change one's mind for the better, heartily to amend with abhorrence of one's past sins. Okay, so when, when John the Dunker comes around and Dunker in water, so when John the Dunker in water comes around and he says, repent every one of you and be baptized, his, what he's saying isn't, hey, we're going to forgive everything. You don't really have to feel fully, you don't have to do anything right now. He's actually saying, get your mind around this, abhor it, change your attitude, and be completely changed. And in that environment, yes, absolutely, all of us can be feeling, and that was the whole point of, of Kimball writing this book. Is that, but he, he said that's not adequate, though, for forgiveness. A change of attitude is not adequate. No, a change of attitude is not adequate. You actually, you actually have to hate it. You actually okay, have to but hate that's not the adequate. sin. Well, it is adequate According as long as you go through the other steps. Okay. Of, it's adequate which, as long as you again, do the other things which, too. Which, again, if, if the, the Pythagogos, the Old Testament, the, the law that brings us to Christ, it had, for example, the restitution was for animals, for one that you stole, right? I mean, restitution was intrinsic into the beliefs of what the Jews believed and therefore... I mean, if you believe that it was this, this shadow of what was to come. Your own church, when you fail to pay tithing and a few years go by, yeah. they don't make you pay back tithing for all the back years, do they? No, I mean, you so They, don't, they you don't require the fullness of restitution as a prerequisite for forgiveness. Not even they do that, right? For something like that, no. Right. Okay, yeah. so why, why not see restitution as the fruit of repentance, not as, as an, uh, maximizing restitution as a prerequisite to, to uh, forgiveness? So, yeah, well, and again, I go back to because the master who gets to make the rules made the rules. And and so if if God, if Jesus, Zacchaeus, right, I I pay back everyone fourfold that I exploited. Right. And Jesus is like, salvation's here today. today. Was he forgiven? It had to be, right? That day? Salvation, absolutely. If, but he hadn't paid restitution yet. But he was going to, right? I mean, whoa, 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 whoa. That, that's not Kimball's standard. It's well, not, and, good and, intentions are not sufficient according to, he's very clear. Well, good intentions that go wrong, because he talks about that, the, you know, good intentions are the road to heck, right? But, but, so but he needs he enough time to pay the restitution. He does, but is he going to do it? And that's why Jesus says this. To, and but Jesus Kim, walking into Zacchaeus' home is salvation, right? I mean, if Jesus walked into your home, Regardless, of, you know, I mean, you may have people that aren't going to be saved sitting in your house. But if it's Kimball's house, Kimball yeah. says, go and pay restitution. Right. And when you're done completing the totality of restitution right. and it's successful in permanently abandoning the sin with all the urges cleared out of your mind and keeping right. all the commandments, reaching the point of no return, then you may be forgiven. And like I just read. But, that this, is a- but this is what. The, so, so my argument with you or your argument with me yeah. isn't so much with me. It's with what the words in the Bible mean. And the words in the Bible mean that you get to the point where you look at sin with absolute abhorrence. 
absolute abhorrence. Could Zacchaeus so, grow in his abhorrence of his exploitation? Ab, ab, I think so. so did he, in did, fact, I think sorry. that that's one of the errors that, that um, people that criticize the church make is, is um, I've heard many times people say, well, as soon as you sin, all of your sins are going to pile back on you again. Well, and, well, well, that's and, what Kimball said. No, he's ta- again, he's talking specifically about, for example, if you're an adulterer and you, and you cease doing adultery and then you go back to it, then yes, your past sins come upon you. Well, but so, not I'll, all I'll read sins. It. Forgiveness is canceled on reversion to sin. Right. Those who feel that they can sin and be forgiven and then, and then return to sin and be forgiven again and again must straighten out their thinking. I'm thinking about porn addicts yes. and those who go back to alcoholism and those who get irritable with their kids. Um, me. Uh, each previously forgiven sin is added to the new one and the whole gets to be a heavy load. He goes on, even though forgiveness is so abundantly promised, there is no promise nor indication of forgiveness to the soul who does not totally repent. We can hardly be too forceful in reminding people that they cannot sin and be forgiven and then sin again and again and expect repeated forgiveness. Right. And he is talking and, and I believe it's very clear from the actual book, from the context. He is talking about if you're an adulterer and you say, I've, I've repented, I'm not doing it anymore. And you go back and you commit adultery and then I'm not doing it. And you go back and commit adultery. Let's take porn addicts. Say, okay, same thing. Okay, let's say a guy looks up porn. Yeah. Uh, he does self-pleasure. He wakes up. He's like, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. And he cries out for forgiveness. He even uses the text of Psalm 51. Okay. Have mercy on me, God. Is, can he be forgiven that day? Sure. I mean, what, what is happening, so, so you and I pre-debate or whatever, pre-conversation. For 15 years, right? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. You sent me a note oh, before yeah, this yeah. one. We, ex- we exchanged me. outlines. Yeah. yeah. So, so before this, and, he, and you asked me kind of that question is, what does it mean that it, take, it can potentially take a long time to be forgiven? And, and part of that is that, you know, if, if somebody excises that out of their soul that day, and never returns again. Like my dad. And never returns again and, and is the key here. My dad gave up smoking literally like that. Dropped it and, and never went back to it again after okay, let, smoking for years. Right? Addict, let's say he relapses right. six months later. Does his previous forgiveness, is it canceled? Well, ac- uh, yes, according to, uh, according to the Doctrine and Covenants and according to what you read in okay. Kimball. And according to true. Kimball, he is not yet totally repentant. Right, because he hasn't changed his mind to the point where he has abhorrence of it. So just be clear, so, a, a kind of a thesis here. Yeah. For Kimball, the kind of repentance that brings forgiveness is not yet adequate unless you've, until you've reached the point of no return. And if you have a spotty or immature or incomplete repentance that is still striving for a deeper consistency, you're not yet forgiven for that sin. It, it, forgiveness can take time. Uh, and it, re, um, it takes time until you've reached perfect consistency and, and, with and, respect and, to that until sin. Until you've reached that point, like it, the definition of the word repentance is, is that you look with abhorrence upon the act that you had. And, and so, again, I, I, honestly, Aaron, I don't think your argument is with Kimball as much as it is with the New Testament, because that's what it means, is you have to get to that point where you actually hate the sin. And if you don't get to that point, then you're going to continue to do the sin. Now, um, one of the things that Kimball says is that we have to do better than our best. We have to continue have to be to, Superman. We have to be Superman. But he says, but you can do that through the Holy Spirit. And he, well, he goes on to say, and because your God's an embryo. Yes. And, and you can do it because the Holy Spirit will help you. And so he's, you know, so one of the things that sounds terrible about all this is like, oh, I'm thrashing around. I'm all by myself. But the whole, the whole point of this and the whole point of Kimball writing this was that the Spirit will help guide your repentance. You know, in uh, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, you know, uh, Famous verse for Mormons is, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But the next verse, which most Mormons don't quote. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Really famous among Calvinists. Yeah, exactly. And and that's the point is that, but it's God working in you to will and to act. But you clearly, because he's he's admonishing you to to work out your salvation, to bring uh, to conclusion your your salvation. Because Philippians 1, 6, prior chapter. God who began a, w- a good work in you will well, bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. And verse 29, he gave us the gift of not only suffering, but he gave us the gift of faith. Right, which again, going back to what faith meant in the uh, meridian of time, right? So, I mean, there's, there's I, I, again, I don't have an argument with that. I love quoting verses, right? So it's like God uh, in, uh, when Romans, in Romans 5.20, where, where Paul writes, you know, Jesus Christ has justified all men unto life. 
I don't need to like argue with you about whether he actually did it or not. Those are the words that Paul wrote about in, in justification. Con- just to be clear, in context, a Protestant like me would argue, and I do argue, yeah. that he's talking about those in the second Adam. Because there's contra- the whole context is the contrast between the one Adam and the second Adam. And those, all of those in the second Adam are justified. Uh, and, and, and so, can I respond to that then? Would that be okay? I mean, because that's, that's not really what our debate was about, right? It's a conversation. But, that's all right. But, but I think that we've we'll we'll like, got 43 seconds. You want to do like one more minute, two more minutes? That's no, okay. We, right. we can go quick. But, but the, the issue, I think right there, the, the point is, is that Jesus Christ um, comes in. So the, what Paul's illustration is, is that Adam sins, and because he sins, then his, the ability to sin goes to all mankind, and, and you have all of these sins committed by all of these people. And all of those sins are overwhelmed by one man, Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. The one act of righteousness. The, the one act of righteousness. Mm-hmm. That all of those sins are sucked up and absorbed and taken care of. And that's why the atonement, and he says, and we have the atonement. It's the only place in the New Testament the word atonement is used, right? Is, uh, is that he says, we have the atonement of Jesus Christ. And so he takes... He takes all of the sins of man, and, and that is so much greater than all of the individual men sinning, because it's so much more work, obviously, I mean, to, to take care of all the sins at once, right? And so if it was only those that are in the second Adam, then that would mean that Jesus didn't actually atone for the whole world. Now, as a Calvinist, I know that you don't believe he did. Not a limited atonement. Guy. Right. Oh, you're in not. In the okay. same sense as others are. Okay, all right. So, so but, but what he's saying there... The, the argument falls apart if Jesus isn't dying for all people, if he isn't uh, um, clearing the sins of all people, because if he's not clearing the sins of all people, then he is weaker than the sins that Adam put out there. And, and Paul's whole point is that Jesus is stronger, is greater than all of the sins of all men. Including murder. Everything, right? Because, again, for, to be justified, even to be justified unto murder, required Jesus to take all of those sins unto himself. And once he does that, now he becomes the judge. And uh, Cicero makes the point, not that everybody's reading Cicero these days, I'm sure, but uh, Cicero makes the point that it's important for those that are giving grace, that are, that, um, you know, these patrons that are giving grace, are, are to pick... Uh, recipients who are worthy. New book about this is called uh, Paul and the Gift by John Barclay. It's a continuation of the new perspective on Paul oh. stuff, and he, it's a really good, I think, a good uh, pushback on stuff like that. But it talks a lot about the reciprocity issue. Can yeah. I tell you one story to end? Oh, of course. Okay, so this is a story to you and me. Fifteen years ago, maybe uh, I was really snarky with you on the street. Sent you an email, and I said, "Bob, I'm really sorry. I know in my heart it was not right. I was, um, it was rude. I, at my heart, I was being uh, nasty." And um, you forgave me, but you forgave me really quickly. You're welcome. And you didn't, uh, you didn't wait for a long process of proving the full consistency of my not ever having been snarky again. Well, you have been snarky again, but it's okay. So the, uh, <laughs> but, but did that, was that forgiveness nullified? Um, if you Your continue, forgiveness If me. you had continued to be snarky after you asked for forgiveness, Has that then ever it been nullified? Been. No. Okay. I still love you. 70 times 7? Yeah, we're, we're going. How much more God? Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. Uh, let's take a two-minute break. Um, please keep your questions questions. Uh, if you want to hear yourself talk, not a good time. I'll um, be on the street. You can see me tonight. So that's a joke. <laughs> and if you could, uh, please, if, if you're LDS, we... Uh, especially invite you to ask questions because there's a disproportionate number of evangelicals here. Let's try, if you have a, a question especially oriented toward Bob and then me, let's try to alternate that if possible. But he's going to always want to, re- Aaron's going to do a, re- even if you ask me the question, Aaron's going to give a response Likewise, anyway. Yeah. So we're, we'll go back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody, questions, question? Mr. Bob, I have a question for you. Okay. The Second Timothy 25 and 26 teach that repentance is a gift from God. Is there a verse, a chapter ahead of that? Is there a chapter ahead of that? <laughs> he said Second Timothy 25 yes, 26. Timothy 25 and 26. <laughs> that would be helpful. Just a sec. Let me, let me look it up. Repentance is a gift from God. Repentance, yes. You want me to read it for you? Or you want to read it? Well, I know it. Oh, you know it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Because it does say, I mean, it just actually says that. You know, mm-hmm. repentance is a gift to God. 
correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. Yep. Sorry. Yeah, so I... Oops. So I don't have any problem with that. That's truly, you know, that uh, God does grant us repentance. That's the whole process. Okay. Go ahead. Next. Um, Bob, you made a point about death, death repentance and mentioned that the church is really against it. And I remember what, I don't remember exactly what it is that Aaron said, but I actually had a new thought here. So thanks for giving me new thoughts. Uh, but the thought occurred to me, if... If the LDS Church doesn't allow deathbed repentance, then why do they allow spirit world repentance? So, and this is kind of the point that I was trying to discuss, or, you know, trying to make, is the fact is that um, in the church, if you have light and knowledge sufficient to make a commitment, so the, the overriding doctrine of the church is there's no such thing as a second chance. So if you have enough light and knowledge that you can make a decision and you don't because you want to continue, you know, what shall we do, live in sin, you know, party, blah, blah, blah. I mean, yes, you, then there is no deathbed repentance or any even spirit world repentance. But if you do not have the light and knowledge able to make a decision for Christ, then that's why we do work in, for the dead. Okay. You want to? Sure. Bob. 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 Robert. So you were talking about Romans 5 5 18, and you were talking about Romans 4 5 and a little bit of Romans 5 1. So I'd kind of like to split the difference and ask about Romans 4 23 through 25. Because while what you said is true about Romans Romans 5 18, it seems to me that you're not using the full context. Because Romans 4, 22 to 25 says that same righteousness he talks about in 518 says it's only imputed to those who have faith in Jesus. So those who don't have faith in Jesus, it's not imputed to. Therefore, they are not part of the justified in Romans 518. So you can both address that. So I just realized we should repeat the questions. Yeah, because that's not going Our very lapel well. mics. Oh, good, um, good, good point. Uh, and I'll just read the verse out loud. Yeah. But the words it was counted to him, he's asking about Romans 4.23. The words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. He went all the way through 25. Who was delivered up for, for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Yes. <laughs> so so the, the point is... is um, I, I don't see how that's any different, to be honest. Then, if you can, you turn to five eighteen, and we'll just or five twenty even. So, so five eighteen says, therefore, as one trespasses uh, led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. I mean, that's to me, that's pretty clear. And he's all men because the difference between the two is that um, in in this again this uh, the, in the system of reciprocity that existed at the time of Christ and Paul as he's writing and so forth, it's completely understood that what grace is, is it's a gift given, you know, unmerited gift, which is a reasonable translation, except it's not full enough. And what it, what it means is that you are then obligated to return. And so by being obligated to return, then you exercise faith. And so particularly that thing um, where he's talking about Abraham's a blessing is because Abraham acted faithfully. He returned faith. Uh, it was counted to, unto him for righteousness, is what it says. And that's why James and Paul actually aren't fighting. They're, 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 uh, James's point of, you know, it's, um, if you have faith, I'll show you my faith with my works. That's exactly consistent with how a, a person living in the first century would have understood the concept of grace and faith and works. So I'm going to read the previous two verses. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following the one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more 
will, the, will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So what we would argue here is that he's speaking of those who have received the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. Okay. Uh, similar to the end of six, the, the wages of sin is death, but the, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift received, like the propitiation in Romans 3, the propitiation is received by faith. So. Yeah. Go ahead. That's fine. Feel free. No, it's here. Here. Yeah, that's fine. So you need to make up for the time that I overdid. So. Go ahead. Question, um, there's really one question, but your answers will answer two questions. Um, Aaron, you had brought up uh, Romans chapter 4, and in verses 7 and 8, Paul quotes um, David in uh, Psalms chapter 32. And Bob, you said that was not an example of forgiveness. Not, not for, for David. Not for David. Yeah. So why then, in Psalm chapter 32, um, uh, verse 5, it says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So my question is, how is that not a, an illustration of forgiveness for David? And how then is Kimball, um, I guess, justified to say that David was not forgiven when in Psalms 32 he says, you forgave the iniquity of my sin? Good question. That is a good question. And, and so maybe one of the answers, I'm going to, let me look here real fast, okay, just so I can get on there. You uh, quoted that right there. Right. Well, actually, contextually, um, what, what I was going to look for is... At the point where he's saying this, um, and we're, hang on. Uh, so I, I think you're putting the uh, wrong set of sins into this verse. So, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, where does he say that the sin that, he's, that he put before the Lord that he didn't hide was the murder of Uriah. He quotes himself by saying, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. He sure. Himself, so, he sure. And, he said that after the so, But the specific one, you're what, thinking about Psalm 51. What, yeah, what I'm, what I'm, and that's the, the point I'm making is that, is that he, he, he writes on a bunch of subjects, right? And there's, there's a point in his writings where he, uh, or not just his writings in his, in his story as well, where, where because, you know, David, thou art the man, right? He gets thrown in his face. He's got he's to deal with it. And, um, and David is not, it, it'd be like taking all of the Proverbs and saying that they related to the end of Saul, Solomon's life, right? And when, when they are something that are apparently being given throughout time, and likewise, the, uh, the, this particular psalm, um, I would have to find the historical context that says that he's talking about his murder of Uriah, because I don't see that in there. And in fact, what I see is someone specifically talking about the fact that, that uh, our sins in general are forgiven. When we acknowledge them, they come, you know, they, they're covered by the Lord. But it's absurd for Paul to use David as an illustration of a forgiven man if he is forever damned to the suffering and torment of regret of being withdrawn from the full enjoyment of eternal life in the presence of God, just, just to stick this in here, Paul, uh, David said in Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of your salvation and upholding me with the willing spirit. And uh, we believe David was fully restored to the joy of his salvation, but it doesn't sound like Kimball believed that. So, if we were on a date together, a bro date, would you be on your phone and just... <laughs> well, would you, be in, would you be in your black book? <laughs> we'd probably have all sorts of books out, and we'd be going at it, yeah. So, the, uh, he doesn't describe, just for what it's worth, he doesn't say that this is David being forgiven. He says, this is describing, as David described the blessedness of him who God doesn't. He's not saying that David is forgiven here. 
and, and, it, and he knows, right, David wrote the psalm. He knows who wrote the psalm, and he's using it as an illustration because what does he say? Because blessed is the man that knows he's forgiven, even as David said. So I don't, I don't think that that's the case. Is David blessed with the forgiveness of all of his sins? Blessed is the man who was forgiven of his sins. Can David say that of all of his sins? You know, it's, honestly, it's a very interesting question at, at a couple of different levels because one of the, one of the issues, and I, I mentioned this, um, and I can, I can look it up, I can give the reference, but you guys can look it up too. It's, um, uh, I think uh, uh, Asa makes the point that um, Paul, or that David uh, was, that David's heart was perfect all the days of his life, including during the time with the incident with Uriah. And so, one of the things, again, one of the things I think is getting lost in here is the fact that, that perfection and even, even goodness can, can be had even as we're in the midst of, of sin, apparently. That, because the kind of perfection that God is talking about in the scriptures is a perfection of um, balance, of, um, of moderation, not, yeah. uh, not like sinlessness. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, the bro date comment was irreverent. Sorry, man. Um, we don't do that. We're grown men. Um, we, we see each other at the North Gate of Temple Square. We talk doctrine. All right. Um, in 1 Kings 11, it says of Solomon that his heart had turned away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord, as was the heart of his father, as David his father. And later, he, Solomon did not wholly follow the Lord as did his, his father David had done. And he goes on to say, um, well, that's, I'll just say that. But um, yeah, I'll stop there. So. Okay. so um, from this source that I have, and if you correct or correct, I'm not sure, which is not the thing to say, but... Um, Joseph Smith, the one that was visiting um, the prophet, uh, he said that there was men on the moon that dressed like Quakers and lived it's up to you, Bob, but I think that's outside the scope of our discussion today. It's kind of beyond what we're talking about. Can I give you one minute answer? I'll give you one second answer. Is the, so he's asking, did Joseph Smith teach that there were pilgrims basically sitting on the moon uh, and that that's who occupied the moon? And the answer is, that was actually a theory taught in um, Eastern newspapers, and he was repeating what was actually a popular theory of the day. So he wasn't, you know, he didn't receive revelation that that's what it was. That was actually what was being published in magazines and newspapers of the day. Can't resist. It was put into patriarchal blessings and you click Philo Dibble's, Philo Dibble, close confidant of Joseph Smith. Yeah. And he, you know, this was pretty integrated into the spiritual, prophetic, revelatory, patriarchal blessings so for what it's worth. But yeah. let's stick to the topic. Sorry. <laughs> not, not trying to be rude. I'm sorry. Please. Related to forgiveness and repentance, especially. So that, that statement was proven to be false. So what, what, how, how could we say exactly that the statements... I don't want to be rude, but I, I really think we should go to the next question. So what do you think, Bob? <laughs> Grab me afterwards. So I, I'd be happy to talk to you about this, I, you know, because um, it, it's just going to be incendiary, my response. So, so let's not go there right now. Let's okay. talk about it later. Yeah, okay. I'm happy to talk about it, but let's do something else. Hi. Um, so anyways, um, I just, this is my first time down here in Salt Lake, and I've been listening to that's about how much I know about it. I really don't know much about Bibleism, but I did come and come as a Christian to try to help with this and learn about it all and try to understand my brothers and sisters. <clears throat> and... Um, I'm listening to the, one of the things that they talk a lot about was the miracle of forgiveness of using that material. And I know that you guys have a certain set of standards of things that you can use, like when the prophet and the speaks of conference and works that have been written by them and the earlier tribes and the panels and all that. And I, was, I thought I understood at the beginning of your talk, because you quoted a lot from the miracle of forgiveness text. Um, I think you said that if you write it as an elder and somebody doesn't count for something, and then also um, 
I just visited the temple yesterday and I went to the historical museum. And his book is right there in a glass case. Yeah. And I don't understand if, it's, if, if what you did say is that it's maybe not written when he was a or something like that. Why would they put him on such a pedestal for the entire country if not all the people who want to come and check out and use as a reference? Not to mention what he stated earlier about the millions of copies and kids and missionaries and things like that, all the languages translated. They didn't want them to know that and believe in its. Um, okay, just to repeat for our mic's sake. So basically your question is, um, if uh, the book, uh, the uh, miracle of forgiveness uh, wasn't written while he was a prophet, uh, why is it still considered good or is it not? And then secondly, if, if it's not really considered scriptural for the church, why has it been republished and uh, translated and, and kind of promoted throughout the world? Sure, and, and it's got a place in the museum. Yeah, well, I haven't been to the museum in a long time, so I can't really give you an answer on that. So, but, the, um, so, but there are a couple answers. The, first of all, uh, he wrote this while he was a member of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. Okay? So he was still a high church official at the time, and he was interviewing people he'd been assigned to deal with homosexuals and adulterers, and that kind of stuff to try and counsel with them. And so out of th those um, interactions that he was having, uh, he kept having this um, kind of the same set of, of stories and scriptures and things that he was giving people. And so that became, those notes became the basis for him compiling this book, okay? And then he shared it with uh, other general authorities. And, and so long story short, in the preface to it, he specifically says, look, this is my work, but Obviously, throughout the church, we believe it's pretty, pretty solid. And despite the fact that there's a couple of things in there that either ring wrong for today's environment or um, were honestly considered probably overly harsh uh, for the environment, that generally speaking today, the way the book is used is if you were to come in and I was your bishop and you had an issue with anything, right? I, so uh, for a long time, the church didn't use the 12-step program. All right, the church now dealing with addictions uses the 12-step program uh, that's been modified for the church use, but, but we do that now. If you read through this, that really is what he's trying to do. He's trying to get you to forsake the sin, to recognize it, to confess it, you know, and, and been through the 12-step program. Absolutely, positively, you know, the, the whole point of the 12-step program is to get to the point where, where you hate the thing that you were doing and you get yourself turned around and you never do it again. That's why you get a chip that says you're so many months or years so, sober. So it's, it's not, uh, the book was very harsh. And it was used a long time because we didn't have an alternative like we do today for people that are coping with addictions and serious problems. And I think also because of things like the social insensitivity of the way the situation around rape and stuff looks, I think those are the reasons that the church has gotten away from it. Yeah. Um. But then it's considered a church source, right? That's all I want to know. It is absolutely absurd for someone to say the church and its apostles and prophets will never lead the people astray, but you're only allowed to determine that if the thing being considered is official. When Jesus said, watch out for false prophets, you'll know them by their fruits. He didn't say, well, restrict your fruit inspection to the official dull stickered bananas. If you publish a work and you're an apostle and you get 1.6 million copies out and you copiously quote it, and you, you said earlier, well, it's just because something's quoted at general conference doesn't mean the entirety is endorsed. Well, the book itself as a general whole itself was endorsed from general conference over and over and over again, not just quotes, but the book itself given out, sold in church distribution centers, given by bishops. I mean, I'm, I'm just incredulous that... Jesus would think it acceptable for someone like Spencer Kimball to get off the hook because, oh, we don't publish that anymore. That's, uh, uh, that's sunsetted. When Jesus said, watch out for false prophets, you'll know them by their fruits. He said, consider grapes. You don't go where the thistles are to get grapes and you don't go to, to get figs where there's, uh, was it thorn bushes? Mormons treat this book like it's a thorn bush. 
I don't have to argue very hard against this book because when I bring it up, people go, ah, that book. Well, if you don't take your prophets and your apostles seriously, why should I? So the reason you should take it seriously is the people that, um, you know, it's like a lot of things, right? So um, people will react to the parts that they know, that they understand, uh, and if they don't know the whole thing, they may make conclusions that are wrong. And that was why I asserted at the beginning of our, our conversation in the first 10 minutes, I believe that the miracle of forgiveness, by and large, it conforms to uh, LDS doctrine and, and, more importantly, for this conversation, to biblical doctrine. And, and with, with very few exceptions, I mean, the, it's, it's harsh look at sin, it's, it's uh, striving to provide forgiveness and, and whatnot. I believe all of those are very biblical in their, in their nature. And when people say, oh my gosh, it's the miracle of forgiveness. Um, so I, I reviewed this with a bishop that I know uh, just last week, just in, um, in conversation. And he's like, I still use it. I give it to people. And because, he, because what happens in conversation is he directs them to what he wants them to read. And, and you know, the, in the church... In order to be something that's accepted as a, a general work, a scriptural work, or even to be generally accepted, is um, they've, they've given that advice, which is that you'll see the quorum talking about it as a whole. The, the 12 apostles and the, and the first presidency will be talking about it as a group and endorsing it. And, you know, again, for the, the shortcomings of the book to say that it's, you know, that's why I made the, the joke about C.S. Lewis, because... We can look at C.S. Lewis, who obviously wasn't Mormon, and find things that he wrote that are really good. In fact, I would say, because having read a few things of C.S. Lewis, I think most of the things C.S. Lewis wrote are really strong and really good. And, uh, and I, I think you probably would too, but yet he's not a Calvinist. He, was never, you know, he wasn't a Calvinist. He think, thought that was right. And so it, it doesn't make the whole work bad that there are parts of it that are difficult to be understood. I mean, that was Second Peter said that of Paul. You know, some of the things which he's written are hard to be understood, and those that are weak in the faith twist them to their own destruction. I would agree on this point. In the, all right, well, in, in the book, one of the key quotes that Kimball uses to support the idea that only complete repentance brings forgiveness, he uses a quote from Joseph F. Smith, which is used in the modern Joseph F. Smith Teachings of the Prophets manual. Yeah. So the church is continuing to teach the essence of what the miracle of forgiveness taught with respect to the repentance that brings forgiveness. Fair enough? Yeah, I, 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 okay. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you both for all the preparation you put forth to this. Um, secondly, I'd like to put forth the question. Um, at the beginning of the debate, you said that the purpose of humanity foundationally is to become like God. Uh, I believe that we're to honor God. But um, in the garden, the, uh, God committed the eating of the fruit specifically because of thinking like God, knowing good and evil. Uh, how would you respond to that? Well, I, yeah, I already kind of said that, right? So the, the point was that um, God said, in the day you eat that fruit, you will die, right? I mean, he called it the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you, the day you eat of that fruit, you shall die. And, um, and the serpent uh, came up and said, oh, no, no, he's lying to you. You won't actually die. Uh, he knows that in the day that you eat that, you'll be like the gods. And it actually uses that phrase. Uh, you'll be like the gods uh, to know good and evil. And when... They do that, and at the end, when God's, God is uh, with whoever he's with, because he's speaking in the plural, he, he says, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. So it actually did come to pass. I mean, and that's, you know, uh, Genesis 3.20. So it's not like, or 3.22, whatever it is. But it's, it's not like that... Uh, um, that everything was taken out of context and um, by the serpent, you know, it's a typical lie, right? We put a little truth in there and we mix it with, with some lies. Yeah, so why would God want you um, to be punished for doing something that he intended to become like God? So the, um, one of the issues within the church that we discuss on this specific point is were, they were given two, two sort of different commandments. And inside the church, we believe that uh, man cannot, man in the garden would not have ever had children. And so one of the commandments he was given was to, uh, uh, you know, multiply and replenish the earth, right? And the other commandment he was given was don't eat the fruit. 
And so there was a tension there of which are you going to do? And, and it forced agency upon the people. And again, as, as Mormons, we believe agency is, is one of the great uh, powers that God has given us. And so that, that's kind of the answer. Let's do the next question. Yeah. So in the garden... Um, Let's go to the next question. Sorry, man. Yeah, it's all good. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, my name is Sam. I don't know if you remember me, Aaron. We met years ago on the street. I talked with you and John and Nathan. And I have a question that I remember years ago, and let me know if it stayed relevant to the topic. That I remember we often got uh, confused with the idea of grace. And I just got back from my mission, which is why I went to talk often. But um, the idea that work, uh, faith without works is dead is something that you know we believe all, um, in the LDS Church. But why is it that if someone is trying to become forgiven or receive the blessings of repentance, why is it that simply the belief that you don't have to work for it makes all the difference, if that makes any sense? The, text, the textual answer I have is Romans 4, verse 4. It says, to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly. So there's a kind of working that's self-reliant. And uh, the only work, and the only obedience that I believe God wants out of us comes from a heart freely and fully forgiven of all of our sins. So if, if I'm not right with my wife... Uh, the stuff I do with her, it's just still icy, right? It is totally inappropriate for me to try to be religious or good or well-behaved before a holy God if my sins aren't forgiven. So another answer to that would be works for us have an evidential role. They authenticate the, the, the authenticity of my faith. They don't have a meritorious role. They don't help me earn or merit or qualify for forgiveness, which is where Kimball went. They have a purpose in my life to glorify God and to love people, right? But they're not a prerequisite to, to uh, forgiveness. So it's, my works are evidential, but they're not meritorious. They're purposeful, but they're not a prerequisite. Um, so I want to love God because I'm forgiven, not in order to be forgiven. I hope that helps a little bit. Thanks for doing this, gentlemen. Uh, in 2007, the church came out with a manual, Teachings of Presence of the Church, Spencer W. Kimball. And this book was cited 69 times. And so it's a prelude to, I just want to read a quick passage from page 208 and 209 and to see uh, what your opinion is, both of yours. It says that the gospel is a program of action of doing things. And it says, this progress toward eternal life is a matter of achieving perfection. Living all the commandments guarantees total forgiveness of sins and assures one of exaltation. Through that perfection which comes by complying with the formula the Lord gave us. In his Sermon on the Mount, he made the command to all men, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. Being perfect means to triumph over sin. This is a mandate from the Lord. He is just and wise and kind. He would never require anything from his children, which was not for their benefit and which was not attainable. Perfection, therefore, is an achievable goal. In the last three years, I've handed out over 400 copies of this book especially the younger people who have not had a chance to see it. And so I'm wanting them to read it, over 400 copies. Should I continue to hand out this book, or is it the apostle's opinion? Is this doctrine or opinion, this book? Well, it's kind of both, right? I mean, it, it is doctrine, and most of it's accurate doctrine. Doctrine. Uh, it, it also, I mean, he's... In the preface, he says it's also his opinion. So it's both. I mean, obviously the church uses it because we believe that it largely encompasses the doctrines of the church as regards to forgiveness of sin. But um, it, it's, it's not, the fact that it's not been folded into the, the four standard works to become the fifth standard works should tell you something about why, you know, why we use it as a supplement and not as a primary text for the, uh, for the church as a whole. Last question from Keith. Uh, this is the, uh, Bob, you mentioned the, in the chapter for restitution. Can you open that up? Um, huh. You looked at restitution for loss of chastity. First, I want to make sure I understood you correctly before I ask the question. Okay. Uh, but the, the last sentence in that statement, or in this paragraph, says, it's better to die in defending one's virtue than, that, than to live having lost it without a struggle. Did you say that you don't believe that is in reference to rape? I don't think that's in reference to the rape. And... The, you know, the Old Testament, oh, sorry, thank you. So I, I actually, um, having gone through, because having read that, um, I decided to take a look more closely at, at the paragraphing, the way that he, he um, 
constructs his sentence and his paragraphs. And um, the way he does is he writes, honestly, a kind of a classical high school approach. You know, make the, make the main sentence, supply the subtopics, conclusion sentence, right? So if you read the first and the last, that's what he's talking about. The stuff in between, he's addressing the issue of rape. And, and right after the issue of rape, he says, there is no um, transgression where there's no, whatever it says, I, I don't have it open again. But wh where there's no uh, volition, what does he use? The, uh, there is no condemnation where there is no voluntary participation. So I mean, it couldn't be any clearer that a rape victim, um, in the Old Testament, there actually was a, uh, um, a, one of the laws uh, where it talks about the fact that if a woman is, is out in a field and is attacked and she doesn't make any noise or whatever that, uh, to try and fend off the rapist that she's, um, you know, that she might be guilty of consensual. What's, and, the, what's the question? Okay, I, then I did understand you correctly. Yeah. If that's the case, then what does the word struggle uh, refer to? And what is it that someone would have to die defending? Well, what he's, what he's saying is that for people that just honestly willy-nilly give up their chastity for, um, because to feel good, that people would be better off to die. In other words, have enough virtue and value of, of this thing which is so sacred that you would be willing to defend it to the death. That, that, from what? From, from you giving it away. I mean, when, when, when the early Christians were, were drug off, uh, you know, to be eaten by lions and stuff, uh, to, and they had to keep the faith there, the, it was better in, in every way in their eyes that they die than the, them to uh, renounce their Christian faith. And the same, that is what he's saying here, is it would be better to die. No, I don't think he's, I think he's saying to you personally, you know, or to me, if this was me, written to me, is, Bob, it would be better for you to die than to voluntarily give up your chastity because it's a grievous sin. But I, I also think that contextually, that's, what, um, that's one of those uh, cultural statements that doesn't have a foundation necessarily in LDS doctrine. And I think it's one of the reasons that they, that, you know, I, I mean, that specific passage is why uh, Spencer Kimball's grandson said that we should stop using the book. Let's do, uh, we're going to do a two-minute closing. I'm sorry, man. We're going to talk afterwards. I'm really sorry. Please, I feel like this really addresses forgiveness. I'm sorry. We, we've got, we're going to have to talk afterwards. We can do more recording even afterwards, but we're going to stop the event so people can go out and do dinner. Um, we're going to do two minutes and two minutes and uh, close it all up. Uh, I'll start mine now. First of all, thank you for Bob. Thank you to Bob for coming. Uh, an apology again for my undignified speech at times and for being overly aggressive or taking up too much time. Seriously, I want to be better and better at uh, being a good conversation partner. Um, if David could be forgiven, I can be forgiven. If the people who killed Jesus can be forgiven, then I can be forgiven. If the woman caught in adultery could be forgiven that day, then I can be forgiven. At my latter years of high school, I remember being curled up in a ball at the bottom of my shower. And I remember crying out to God, God, my repentance is not, it, it, it's, it's pathetic. I, I'm not righteous. I'm not godly. So please, just, just forgive me now. Just cut through it all and forgive the bottom of me completely. And when I reached the end of myself, particularly when I, when I saw that, that verse in Romans 4, verse 5, God, just trust Him who justifies the ungodly. It opened up a whole new world for me. And it was that, that the free forgiveness of sins with my weak, incomplete, spotty, immature repentance. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. God forgave me and He opened up a whole new world of forgiving people who had wronged me that I hated, who were in my enemies, and He deepened my repentance. After that, having the foundation of forgiveness as the starting point and the enduring foundation. Not as the goal. Forgiveness not as the goal, but as the foundation. 
God made us alive together with him, Paul writes, with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of my debt that stood against me with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to a cross. I also want to thank, thank you, Aaron, for uh, setting this up. Uh, Aaron did all the legwork, so you know, I, I appreciate that very much. The, uh, um, the conclusion to this for me is, um, again, and thank you for you. You guys have all been very, very polite and generous, so I, I thank you for that as well. Um, the, uh, the conclusion sorry. to this, Here's sorry, Siri. apparently, <laughs> hey, Siri. hey Siri, good timing. So the, the, uh, the, the thing for me about talking about the miracle of forgiveness is because I personally have, have experienced it. And I've, I've had to go through the repentance process and, and be forgiven of my sins. And it's real. And so when I read, and you know, I'm, I'm a nut about, about the scholarship around the Bible, and Aaron knows that, that it's important to me. And so when I read John the Baptist saying, repent, you know, repent and be baptized. And after, after the day of Pentecost, you see um, Peter stand up and, and quote Joel to them, you know, that, that there's going to be signs and wonders and that everyone who believes and calls upon the Lord will be saved. And they say, well, what does that mean? And he says, well, repent, every one of you, and um, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And, and that's what the Bible teaches on the subject. And so I believe that forgiveness of sins is an ongoing process, that it's something that we continue to receive throughout our lives, because as it happens, we change throughout our lives. And something that was easy for me last year is hard for me next year, and something that was hard for me last year is easy for me now. And so I, I think it's um, a biblical doctrine that forgiveness comes after repentance. You have to do the metanoeo in order to be forgiven of your sins. And that means you have to literally, according to the Bible, learn to hate your sins. And I think that that's a very important concept. Uh, however, I will also concede that Spencer W. Kimball's book in many places is sort of socially unacceptable today, but that doesn't mean that it, every part of it's bad. There's still things that can be used out of it but I, I think it's really best used as a tool for bishops or stake presidents or others who, who, are not, or who are going to be able to help guide people through reading it and getting the right stuff out of it. So anyway, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for us. Oh, yeah, likewise. Thank you. Yeah.